Hi, um, <clears throat> welcome back. Um, we're going to turn to the second segment of this study in continental philosophy. Uh, in the first segment, we were working on Heidegger's book Being in Time and using that to introduce the basic idea of phenomenology, what phenomenology is, and so on, <clears throat> excuse me, and to introduce and develop the phenomenological idea that uh, being in the world is the fundamental way we should understand our experience. And then we uh, worked at drawing out some of the depths, depths of that. Um, and as you'll remember, the pretty uh, pivotal notion that Heidegger's analysis revolved around was the notion of home. And what he showed about being in the world is that uh, as being in the world, we're kind of defined simultaneously by two quite different realities, let's say. We're defined by the fact of being at home in the world. That's the core meaning of in. Remember, in as in habitation. But at the same time, the, 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 our character of experiencing beings is that there's a kind of intrinsic unhominess uh, that is constitutive of, of our being and that, that we experience in anxiety. And that's the domain in which uh, um, conscience in particular uh, manifest, presents itself, manifests itself. And so we saw the human being, the person, us, being in the, being in the world as uh, an interesting, uh, well, interesting, that's not a very good word, um, as a kind of important and challenging tension between the experience of being at home and the experience of unhominess or not being at home. Um, and anyway, that especially by looking at that issue of uh, unhominess and conscience, we, uh, in, 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 an, in the final section 60 that we read, in, in sort of um, transforming the notion of our home into the notion of situation, uh, the situation, we, we really uh, use that analysis to bring out something like the foundations of, of ethics. Uh, or ethical experience. Uh, so we're going to move on now uh, uh, to look at politics in that context, uh, both which is going to be an issue of both understanding what politics is, both both uh, sort of sp and, and that both sort of conceptually or in principle and also in practice, uh, and in addition understanding what it is in this co in the sort of phenomenological context. Uh, we're also going to think then about, kind of on the model of ethics, we're going to think um, about what kind of imperatives that pus puts to us for political action and so on. Um, anyway, that's that's probably what we're going to do now. Um, we're And now we're going to shift from focusing on um, Heidegger's being in time to focusing on uh, Jacques Derrida's book, Rogues. Uh, we're just, it's, it, this book is two essays. We're just going to read the first essay, uh, which is called... Um, the reason of the strongest. Uh, I'm almost always going to refer to it just as rogues, though, even though I'm really referring to that one essay in the, in the book. Um, I'll try to remember to refer to the essay separately, but whatever, I probably won't. Um, and anyway, and we'll continue using uh, my book, um, Sites of Exposure, as a helpful um, guide. Um, and that will probably be uh, even a little more prominent now than it was before because uh, sites of Exposure is going to uh, offer us a bit of a richer description of some of the realities of political life um, uh, than you get in Derrida, which is much more just a sort of a conceptual analysis. Anyway, that's where we're going to go. So let's begin then by first uh, returning a little bit to that uh, fundamental experience of home. And uh, to, to do that, let's look at this image. This, uh, this is a very famous painting from... 1930 by Grant Wood. It's called American Gothic. Uh, it's in the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, uh, uh, I guess I want to use this as a helpful image of home um, and to, uh, to, to use this image to let us think a little bit about 
some of the ambivalence of the experience of home. So this is a picture of a, a man and his daughter um, and their house, yeah. farmhouse, I guess. And uh, I mean, I say it's his daughter. I say it's his daughter because uh, uh, in fact, I know that that's what the artist Grant Wood claimed, although I, I guess there's no real justification f aside from that for interpreting it this way. So you might very well interpret it as his wife, uh, as many people have done. Uh, she's younger than he is, uh, but that's that's no uh, that's no challenge to uh, the experience of her being his wife. So so you could think of it as his wife or his daughter. Take your pick. Um, but but I guess um, I want you to think about what what kind of thing this conveys. Uh, what what is the form of life that's put on display here? And I I think I think there are pretty straightforwardly you could see at least two kind of opposed things i think in uh, it's it's pretty common it has been pretty common ever since uh, grant wood painted this for people to think of this as a bit of a critical portrayal of the people portrayed here in that it they look kind of uh, stiff and uh, they don't look particularly happy um, and the pitchfork actually looks a little bit threatening um, he's looking at you the wife or daughter isn't looking at you she, i guess she's looking at him that could mean a lot of things it c could mean she's not really allowed to look at you right and she's sort of behind him so it kind of looks like a guardian with his weapon and some of the things here is guarding is the the wife daughter um uh who i suppose is behind him in that way kind of as a support so she's sort of partially one of the guardians herself but on the other hand she's maybe one of the possessions he's also guarding and then there's his house and you know they really look pretty um pretty stiff i mean they're really really straight they look pretty stiff they look pretty stern uh you don't see a lot of happiness or uh pleasure communicated there and you similarly you don't get a look a lot of look of love between them i mean he's not really looking at her but the fact that he's got her behind her with his weapon there may mean he's like looking at you to say keep away from my thing so that could be a bit of a reflection of her and she's looking at him i think but it doesn't look exactly loving i'm not quite sure what her look would mean um but so i say some of those things to to suggest that the kind of negative critical portrayal here and and add to that you know that that uh, big gothic window on the house you know we we tend to think of those gothic architectural style well we, we draw on those gothic architectural features when we want to make horror movies um, so you could think of this as a as a as a portrayal of the horror of home life uh, this you could think this is what it's like to be at home uh, you got to live with an oppressive patriarchal dad who uses force uh, partially I suppose to keep other people out but also to keep some people in like the woman and I said daughter, wife. I mean, maybe she's both. Um, who knows what goes on in that house, that, that horror house. Um, you know, and the house is all painted nice and white, uh, sort of virginal white, but you might think, well, maybe it's a little bit nastier than that. So, um, so, uh, so that's, that's, it seems to me that's a pretty straightforward interpretation of that picture. And, and I, why do I say it's straightforward? Because I think, I say that because I think that's the interpretation almost everybody has had who's ever seen it. Um, and so first I would say, th think about that as not just what happens to be a view about these people, but maybe that's a little bit what home life is like always. You know, think of home as, think, of, think about the, 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 the way that you might say that a home is, the way, is a way that people kind of take a stand against the outside world and shut their home against intruders and then what goes on in that home uh, is really really depends on the power structure which really depends on typically how the head of the household handles it and that's pretty commonly the man and it's pretty commonly you know patriarchal and, and uh, oppressive of a lot of things so you know what's it like to grow up at home like let's say that's his daughter let's say that is who it is 
what was it like to grow up in that house? Doesn't look like it was fun, and it doesn't look like she's going anywhere. All right? So you can also think about the way that the house, the home, has, through its repressive powers, just holds people in it like a prison, and even sort of reproduces and perpetuates itself in that he, he and his ways of living have turned her into another thing just like him. She's going to do that to her kids if she ever has them. So, so she's going to marry somebody like him and do that to her kids. So there, there's, a, there's a little story, just using that image. There's a little story about what home life is like, and I'd like you to think about that, that, that this idea that the home uh, can be both an armed border against the outside that absolutely does not welcome intruders and is trying to defend itself against them and on the other hand it has a kind of a iron fist of authority oppressive authority that weighs down on the family members that's the, that's a pretty negative portrayal but you could see that in that picture but then i didn't want to suggest another interpretation of that picture because uh, and this this is the one that grant wood himself i think more or less advocated although as i say i don't know if there's any reason particularly to believe the the things the painter happened to say when he was advertising it. Um, anyway, you know, you could also think the, that what you're seeing here is the portrayal of hardworking people. You know, that pitchfork is the thing that man used to um, move the hay. He uses it to move the hay every day. He's old now, but he's been doing it maybe since he was 17 or 25. He's been moving the hay to feed the cow. Uh, so, so that that pitchfork may be the f the the emblem of the incredibly hard work he's done through his whole life uh, that has made for him a home and that's allowed him to have a quite nicely constructed house um, and to raise a family um, and you know it, maybe maybe it's the kind of um, that whole thing you might think of as a kind of image of a kind of pioneer spirit in the, in the sense of people who went out and made a home for themselves uh, and built something up from nothing. And, you know, look at their clothes, like they're, they're farmers, and you can see that in his overalls and so on, but he's got a nice suit jacket on. And the daughter slash wife has very nice clothes on, nice little bit of jewelry and that little cameo on her neck and beautifully washed white shirt, nicely sewn dress, pretty pattern. Um, and, you know, the house, again, is actually quite quite beautiful beautifully constructed and freshly painted or recently painted you know uh, maybe not that recent i guess you can see a little bit of where oh no that's just shadow but it's in pretty nice shape nicely maintained uh, and then the nice barn there over at the side uh, on a sunny day like you might think of this actually as an image of uh, ha happiness and the happiness and productivity of the uh, um, uh, hard working pioneer farmer and in that case the gothic window which is you know an image of a medieval christian church basically you might think of that as a sign of the religious aspiration the home is also like a temple of god you know so you could see all those things in it too and I, you know i don't think i don't think there's anything in the picture that straightforwardly allows you to choose one or the other in fact i think on the contrary what one of the reasons why i think this picture is so gripping is because it it precisely uh, presents pretty directly that um, the um, inherent ambivalence of being at home. And the home as a site both of nurturing and growth and development and the home as a kind of prison. Actually, let me go back to one other thing I said just to highlight that ambivalence again. You know, I said this might reflect sort of the pioneer spirit of this guy who went out and made a home for himself, you know. And you might think, yeah, that's pretty great. But then you can ask another question. Where did he make that home? You know, in this case, that's America. Uh, he made it on lands that were formerly the the living grounds of some of the indigenous peoples of North America, and so he his his pioneering his his being a settler is also a part of uh, you know what they call us the that settler uh, settler colonialism. Uh, so, so you might think, oh, this is—it's nice that he built a home for himself, and you might see that as a real monument to his hard work and self-motivation, and, and and presumably also of his wife, although 
either her or maybe his wife is dead from the hard work of childbirth and domestic labor. Who knows? Um, you might see it as that rich thing, but you can also see it as a house that builds itself, a home that builds itself at the expense of other people from whom it, uh, with whom it's in antagonistic relationship, like it took the land away from somebody else who would have used it for something else. So I talked before about him using the pitchfork as a sort of, looks like kind of a wall against outsiders, a kind of weapon in that sense. But, you know, it's not just, the, the home in that sense isn't just a, a barrier is now set up to what is factually outside it. The home itself was already an entry into the domain of the world of others and an aggressive appropriation of it. And it seems to me that's also uh, always inherent in any experience of having a home. Um, so, yeah. So that's that's a that picture I think is worth keeping in mind and, and uh, those issues. That's that stuff about the the ambivalence of it being at home. That's the topic of uh, of lesson seven of sites of exposure, and um, you know. Um, I say here, for example, coming to be on page 62, coming to be at home then is simultaneously both liberating and imprisoning. On the one hand, it establishes a platform from which to live. Coming to be at home gives one a new power to engage with the world and an ability to live on a new level. But on the other hand, uh, it, it, binds one to, to one's, it binds one to a very particular thing, right? And it's a, both a platform from which to launch ourselves into the world and a defensive shelter against what is alien. Um, the whole chapter is, is exploring that ambivalence in a little bit more detail. I want to, so I want to think about that, that ambivalence then in two ways. Ambivalence means, you know, by, doubly, but by value, two values, and the two values are basically good and bad, right? So I want to think about how it's both good and bad with respect to oneself and how it's both good and bad with respect to other people with respect to your oneself that, that I was sort of getting at that already when I was saying yeah maybe this was a nice home life or maybe it was that person just held down to a miserable oppressive existence to think about the daughter um, well even without the, the the nastiness that's sort of implied in that way of talking you can think about home in general you know you grow up into a home and you know, you become a particular part of that family, a particular particular part of that home, and you learn how to live in it, and it it lets you be someone. That's the liberating character of it. It lets you be someone because it lets you belong. Right, you belong with those people, and you learn how to be part of their world. Um, but it also makes you this particular person, and so there are other people you could have been, and they aren't those. Now, you, it's not that you actually were those people, so you didn't lose something actual but there's a way in which your possibility your potential was turned into just this actuality right? and so you can feel that when you're growing up you know and i mean you can feel it at any age for sure from from uh probably three years old to 70 years old but but we really in our culture pretty pronouncedly feel it typically as teenagers so when we're teenagers in, in Western culture, at least in the 21st century, you know, we're growing up um, with the idea that we're going to be adults not too long from now. And uh, and the sense and the sense in this culture is that when we're adults, we're going to go out and sort of shape a life of our own. And when you're a teenager, uh, you really commonly have that sense that you start defining yourself by the person who's going to be independent of this family. And you start to see all the ways your family does things that aren't maybe the way you were going to do them. And you feel the frustration of the ways the family doesn't let you be the person that you think you would be, that you aspire to be, or something like that. Um, uh, and so teenagers are f famously, you know, critical of their parents and critical of their home. And they're eager to go out and start a kind of independent life. That, incidentally, in case you're interested, is is one of the central dimensions that I look at in my book, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, that kind of experience, the experience of forming an individual identity, especially through adolescence. So if you're ever interested in that, you could look at that book. But anyway, um, so yeah, so in terms of the ambivalence of the house with respect to oneself, like or the home, the home amazingly lets you be someone. 
from kind of amorphous nothing. Like, and if you're just left on your own without a home, life's not going to turn out very nicely for you. So the home actually lets you be something because it lets you belong to a family and to a world and so on, to a life, a shared life with others. Um, but then who you come to be is inherently and integrally shaped by the, the way that family group, that home group, interprets who people are and who they're going to accept and how people should behave and so on. So you become a self in becoming a member of that group. That's the strong thing, that you become someone, but the weak thing is that you become a very specific person who has to meet the expectations of, of that little home world. And all the other things you might be get shut down. And that can be more benign, in the case of you know a relatively healthy un upbringing, or pretty oppressive in the case of the nastier upbringing that I was sort of imputing to that picture. Um, so that's the ambivalence of home with respect to a, an individual. And, and that, just as an aside there, remember that Heidegger was talking about our being at home and our unhominess. Uh, well, that thing I was talking about, about being at home but feeling the limitation of your potential, is, is a little, which can be very anxiety-producing when you're stuck to live a, living at home, that, that, that can be a way of looking at that theme of the unhominess that's integral to us. That's, that's a way to start thinking about that. Anyway, um, now the ambivalence of home with respect to other people, um, which in the long run is going to be our, our biggest theme, although I'm bringing these two themes up of the ambivalence with respect to self and with respect to others uh, simultaneously, and they're, they're linked in pretty intimate ways. And so I won't always be talking about the ambivalence with respect to oneself issue. It will come up for sure, but I won't always be talking about it. I am, because we're going to talk about politics, I am going to be focusing more on issues with respect to others. But you should keep that in mind and, and think about how that issue is implicitly interwoven in the, in the more explicitly political issues of dealing with others that we're going to go on to talk about. Anyway, uh, now the ambivalence with respect to others. Um, well, one of them, what, what is a home? Like a, a home is a place where le we live, yes, but, but, it's, but it's, not just, it's not just a way we set up a, ball, uh, a wall against the outside world. Uh, very pointedly, a home is also something that we let the outside world in. Uh, mo you know, most straightforwardly with the theme of guests. Uh, and, uh, and that's often what we want in a home, right? We want uh, people to come and visit us. Like, imagine that pioneer family again. That's, you know, uh, um, imagine, uh, let's look at it again for a second. You know, imagine these people in American Gothic here uh, living out on their farm. Uh, they might get pretty lonely. And if it really is a long ways away from uh, the next farm or whatever else, they, they might be kind of interested when they see some dust rising on the road and a wagon or a car. This was painted in the 1930s, so it could be a Model A or a Model T car comes rolling down the road. You know, and the man might have his pitchfork out there ready to poke someone if it's the wrong person, but they also might be hoping, oh, it's, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Barrett coming to visit. Uh, you know, they, they, you could be very enthusiastic about having people come and see you. And you might say, oh, we haven't seen anybody for a while. Um, it'd be great if you'd come in and talk. That's how, uh, that's how the beginning of Plato's Republic begins that way. Um, Socrates is brought back to... Uh, the home of Cephalus by Cephalus's son Polymarchus, and Cephalus says, "Oh, hey, Socrates, I haven't seen you in uh, in a long time. People don't come to visit me so much now that I live out here in the harbor. Um, why don't you come down more often so we could have a nice talk? You know, I love to talk with people, right? So, so I just want you to think about that idea that, um, yeah, sure, to some extent, it's a wall against the outside world, but." But there's a significant way in which we often want to invite people into our house. And so one of the big meanings of home is hospitality. One of the big meanings of home is it is the site where we are able to host a guest. Uh, and indeed, that notion of the guest-host relationship is one of the, uh, one of the oldest... Um, sort of quasi-political notions, one of the oldest models for understanding how 
people who don't normally live together are, are going to um, be able to interact and should be able to interact together well, right? And so, so in a way, uh, if you could trace back the history of, you know, political thoughts, a lot of the roots of that are in the notion of hospitality and the sort of uh, imperatives of hospitality. So that's the thing you might think about too. Anyway, I just wanted to make that point that um, the a big meaning of home is is not j just that it is 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 not just sorry a big meaning of home is that it it is not just for the family members but it is also for guests that it's the place where we want to be able to welcome people to bring people into our world uh, so so the part of the part of the ambivalence of home is that it is it's a way of dealing with other people and it's a it's a establishing a home and then and an enacting a home living a home is simultaneously a gesture of hostility and a gesture of hospitality it's pro, it's it's making a reality into which people can and will be invited it's pro, pro, it's providing a place that people are allowed to come provided you invite them provided they come and and go there on your rules right but it's also a gesture of hostility in that it's setting up an armed border it's going to fight over and also it was brought about in an act of appropriation uh, exclusionary appropriation so it's it's interestingly both inclusive and exclusive um yeah so that's those, those i want to say say a couple more things a couple of little things just to draw your attention to it but that, those are the themes now that we want to pursue we want to pursue that ambivalence of home um, taken now at the level of politics. Now, before before I get to that, so this is the, really the, the last thing I want to say. Uh, before we talk about politics, I want to go back just to talk about home for a moment and identify the the idea that home can have a lot of different layers. There are a lot of different levels at which uh, home can happen. And so this is a thing that I actually talk about pretty centrally in, in Lesson 4 of Sites of Exposure. So page 37, right in the middle of the page, beginning of the second paragraph, making ourselves at home means establishing a sense of belonging, a sense that we are legitimately of a piece with this reality. So that's a, probably a pretty big and important idea to, to start from. Right? The experience of home is, uh, is basically the experience of belonging. And then uh, I talk about the way this can happen at a number of levels. So I give th three examples. I talk about a child learning to walk because that's, that's a child learning to be at home in its body, to inhabit its body. Uh, so the, the issues of homemaking are alive in your very being, a uh, walking body. Right? That, that uh, the, the same processes that are integral to how you come to inhabit a richer world were already taking place in those years from let's say birth to how old you were when you walked nine months 18 months whatever it was different children do it at quite different times um uh but you know somewhere in the range of a year or so i guess on average um in that year you had to occupy your own body right um and then i get another example though I, I talk about riding a bicycle uh learning how to ride a bicycle uh, similarly, you have to become at home in this new material relationship to the world where, where you have a sense of belonging in that sphere, right? And then I, I give a further example then of, of developing a new relationship with another person, a new romantic relationship where you're going to come to be at home with that person and together you're going to make a home. Um, so I mentioned those ones. Uh, you should go back and look at those uh, to 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 look at what the process of so to speak homemaking is and how it's operative at every level of the experience of design right from the minimal uh, ability to function as a as an organic moving capable body and a very experience of i can do things has that notion of habituation and uh, inhabitation homemaking built into it through the level of the incorporation of technological means in our engagement with the world, and then 
into our experience of sharing our experience of living with someone else. And then that last one has more layers too. Middle of 41, for most of us, one of the most significant dimensions of this surrounding world is the family home. And so coming to be at home in the world is, in general is typically mediated for us by coming to be at home in our families, right? So, you know, Heidegger said we're being at home in the world. What that has meant for most of us, almost, almost everybody, is that in one way or another, we grew up into some kind of family experience and came to be at home in a familiar set of people as our way of coming to be at home in the world. And then uh, 41 to uh, 42 gives some examples of different, quite different kinds of family life to, so that you can look at them and notice that people are not going to come to be at home in the world in the same way. Coming to be at home means coming to have a sense of belonging, uh, and that brings with it a sense of familiarity and propriety. This is the way things work. This is the way things should be. And that means people come to be at home in the world by becoming habituated to quite different senses of how things should be. Uh, well, somewhere around here, <laughs> I have a sentence. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's on 42. Sorry. It's on 42, the very beginning of the final paragraph in 42. In all these cases of coming to be at home in a family, becoming at home involves coming to expect a certain range and style of ways of behaving that characterizes that ha family's home life and how it interacts with the uh, larger world. Right, so coming to be at home means coming to embrace a bunch of expectations. You expect things to go this way or that way. Um, again, there is, there's a quotation, I think, on 43. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's the bottom of 43. For the children, growing up in their different families will involve learning to belong to them. So in the, in the world of dealing with other people, having a sense of belonging is a matter of learning. You have to learn how to fit in to the expectations those people bring. So you become someone. You develop your sense of self by letting your sense of self be interpreted through their terms and learning to inhabit that, right? And that's, you know, that's going back to the initial ambivalence I was saying about home with respect to the self. You become someone at the price of being this kind of self and not those other things you might have been, right? But so it's, it's a matter of learning. Belonging is a matter of learning how to belong, right? But then the point is, beyond all those things, and then this is the point we're really going to start to focus on, beyond those levels of the body, the bicycle, the romantic partnership, growing up in a family, all of those things, um, we're, we're, um, we also come to belong in social worlds that go belong the, beyond the family. Um, and that's the thing that, um, that I want to now go on and talk about. So I want to talk about that, that the relationship between the fact that our core experience of being someone is inherently rooted in and dependent upon these experiences of being at home, the relationship between that and the demands and the realities of participating in and carrying out a broader social life beyond the life in the, in the family or, or in the more local sense of home. Uh, so I want to talk about a, 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 the sense of a social world beyond home the relationship between those two things, particularly revolving around that issue of the ambivalence um, of the experience of of, um, of being at home. So, I'm gonna, so we're going to go on and talk about that next, and uh, and then we're going to move into talking specifically about the theme of democracy uh, and some related issues as they come up in Derrida. Okay, let's leave it there for this one. <laughs>